morning, everybody. It's nice to see you all who have come to worship God this morning. And you're visiting with us, and you're very welcome. And we're delighted to have you here. Just a couple of announcements. And that's uh, first of all to remember, or sorry, to remind the choir on Tuesday night at eight o'clock. Uh, choir practice here on Tuesday at eight o'clock. That's for our carol service. And then a little bit of advance announcement for the PW. That's on Tuesday, the sixth of December. Uh, so that's PW Tuesday, the sixth of December, eight p.m. in the church hall. And all ladies are very welcome uh, to that evening. And then on the next night will be our monthly midweek meeting. So that will be on Wednesday, the 7th of December, at 8 p.m. in the church hall, our monthly midweek meeting. Uh, and after, hopefully, under, after, that committee, uh, sorry, after that midweek meeting, hopefully, we're going to have a short committee meeting after the, the midweek meeting, only, have, only for a few moments on Wednesday, the 7th. I think these are all the announcements. Uh, we wait on David to lead us in morning worship. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Eternal Father, in your grace and in your goodness, you have called us into the stillness and into the quietness of this house of prayer, that we as a people might seek your face, that we as a people might worship you in spirit and in truth. But the more we seek to do this, our Father, we realize we fail to do so unless you grant us the aid and the assistance of your Holy Spirit. So we pray you would send your Spirit amongst us this day so that together as a people we might truly engage in the worship of your great name. And that's our prayer we ask in the Saviour's name. Amen. We continue to worship God using the words of the Psalm number 40, the Psalm number 40 in verses 1 to 5. I waited for the Lord my God and patiently to bear at length to me he did incline my voice and cry. To hear.
having lifted up our voices to the praise of the great God of the heavens and the earth, let us now bow our heads and in humility seek his face in prayer. Let us all pray. Eternal and ever blessed God, sometimes when we come into your house to worship you, our hearts can be laid low. We may be sad. We may be unhappy. We may, as the psalmist would put it, be disquieted within ourselves. But we bless you, our God, as we come into your house and as through the words of the Psalms you speak to us and you remind us of just who you are, your greatness and your goodness to us. Our hearts are not only stirred, but our hearts are blessed. And we realize as we read your word, it was so often the case for the psalmist as well. In his own life, both in his family and in the nation over which you placed him, he faced trial. He faced difficulties. He faced challenges. And so as we read the Psalms, we read of one who at times was cast down in his heart, in his mind, and in his soul. And so it is there in Psalm number 40, he approaches you, he seeks your face, and he waits patiently. For he knows who is he, a sinner saved by grace, to demand anything of you, the eternal God. And so he waits quietly, and he waits patiently. And in your time, our Father, you bow your ear to his prayer. You hear his prayer. And he speaks of how you lifted him out of the miry pit. Out of the muck and out of the dirt. And our God, not only did you lift him out of such. But you set his feet upon the rock. He had to be patient. He had to wait. And in your time, you blessed him. You lifted him up. And you strengthened his heart and his mind. And so he has moved our Father to praise you and to bless you. And in light of his thoughts, in light of his worship, we come as a people and we recall your goodness to us. I, our God, once we were lost in nature's darkness, without Christ and without hope in this world. Our feet were bogged down in the muck and in the filth of sin. But in your grace and in your mercy, you awakened us. By your Spirit, you did a work in our hearts, in our minds, and in our souls. You brought to life that which was dead. And you set our feet upon that rock, which is Christ Jesus. Thus as a people this day, though we may have entered this building downhearted, maybe even disillusioned, we bless you that we hear the truth 
And we bless you, our God, that that truth helps us. That truth stirs us. That truth refreshes us. Oh, Lord, our God, what an honor it is for us to recall your goodness to us. What an honor it is for us as a result to bless your thrice holy name. And as we do so, our God, if it pleases you, we pray you would bless us and you would strengthen our hearts and our minds. But as we bow before you on this bright, sunny Lord's Day morning, we have seen the sunshine. And even at this time of the year, it shows up the dust in the air and the dirt on the roads and the dirt even on our car. Yesterday, our God, it was such a dark and dismal day and a car which was dirty looked clean. But today, our God, the sun shines and we see darkness that yesterday was hidden. And we realize as we bow in your presence and the glory of your brightness shines upon us, we see that we are a sinful people. We see that we need our sins forgiven, our iniquities taken away. So we come as a people, our heads bowed, humbled before you, praying that for the sake of your dear Son, you would cleanse us and you would forgive us so that the prayers that we present to you this day will indeed be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For it's in the Saviour's name we pray. Amen. We turn to the Scriptures, to the Word of God, to Second Chronicles chapter 33. Second Chronicles chapter 33 and verses 1 to 9. And you will remember in our recent studies in relation to Manasseh, and his, what you might call his downfall, his apostasy. The first sermon was simply entitled, Darkness. Then the next sermon was entitled, What Happens When a King No Longer Believes in God. And today our sermon is entitled, The Darkness Deepens. Second Chronicles chapter 33 and verses 1 to 9, let us hear the word of God. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 55 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had broken down, and he erected altars to the Baals and made Asherahs and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he burned his sons as an offering in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and used fortune-telling, and omens, and sorcery, and dealt with mediums and with wizards. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. And the carved image of the idol that he had made, he set in the house of God, of which God said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever, and I will no more remove the foot of Israel from the land that I appointed for your fathers. If only they will be careful to do all that I have commanded them, all the law, the statutes, and the rules given through Moses. Manasseh led Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem astray to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed. 
before the people of Israel. And we close there in verse 9, and we trust God will bless this reading from his word. Well, today in our catechism, we come to question number 25. And the question asks, what doth Christ, or how doth Christ execute the office of a priest? How does Christ execute the office of a priest? And to help us as always try to understand what the catechism is, is fundamentally telling us, you're going to help to help me as usual. First of all, thinking about some of the islands that are around the British Isles. First of all, thinking about an island that is we, what we might call the opposite of a woman. What is the island that is the opposite? And it's not that complicated, even though some people today seem to think it is. It's called the Isle of... That's right. It's called the Isle of Man. But moving further afield, away down through the Irish Sea and into the English Channel, there's another island. And it's an island years ago that many, many boys' brigade companies from Northern Ireland used to go over for a week's camping. I'll give you a clue. It's an island that's the opposite of black. It's the Isle of White. That's right. Well, not worry about the spelling, but it sounds the same, doesn't it? The Isle of Man, the Isle of White, and then there's another island. And there are some members, I was telling them down in Carnlock today, and they sh share the same surname as this island. It's a funny shaped island. It's shaped like this. And you can see it from the front door of Carnlock Presbyterian meeting house off the west coast of Scotland. Anyone tell me what that island would be called? Called what? That's right. It's called Ailsa Craig. It's called the Ailsa Craig. And it's quite a, a hard island, from you would think, from where we go to go on to and to explore. It's not that big. But there's one other island. We went down the Irish Sea and into the English Channel before. But now I want you to go up the Irish Sea, right up to Fairhead, and then take a left. I'll give you a clue. It's an island that sounds sort of cross, sort of angry. I don't even know what that island would be. That's right, Rathlin Island, I don't know what it means in the original, but when you think on it, doesn't it sound very angry? Rathlin. Rathlin. Island. You know, I was reading this week about a, a man by the name of Robert the Bruce. And you who know history will know that Robert the Bruce eventually became the king of Scotland. But Robert the Bruce, his wife's family had connections in our part of the world. His wife's family owned a lot of land between the village of Glenarm and the town of Larn. But anyway, Robert the Bruce wanted to become the king of Scotland. But there was a problem. There was someone else it would seem, who didn't want him to become king of Scotland. There was someone else who wanted someone else, perhaps himself, to gain that crown. But anyway, history tells us, and I'll not go into the details, but history tells us that somehow the, the opposition, if you like, the other person who was in the road of Robert the Bruce becoming king of Scotland. He ends up killed. He ends up murdered. And Robert the Bruce is enthroned the king of Scotland. But in truth, 
his name or king in name only. Because there was an English king at the time nicknamed Longshank. And he was no friend of Robert the Bruce. He didn't want Robert the Bruce to rule Scotland. And what does Robert the Bruce do? What is he forced to do? He's forced to run away. Some people think he hid somewhere around Campbelltown over there in Scotland. But many, many people who live over here and many people who live in Rathlin believe that Robert the Bruce made his way to the safety of Rathlin Island. And he hid away in a cave that to this day is called Bruce's Cave. And you can imagine that Robert the Bruce has a lot of time to think about the future. What is going to happen? What is he going to do? How can he regain the throne of Scotland, not just in name, but in reality. And anyway, we're told, as he sits and ponders, and as he sits and thinks, he sees something. He sees a little spider in the cave, trying to weave a web. And he watches the spider as it tries to go from one part of the cave to the other part of the cave. And it's a long, long, long distance. And the spider tries and the spider tries and the spider tries and the spider fails. But eventually, eventually after much trying, the spider reaches where he wants to reach and begins to weave his web. And many people contend that that is where we get the saying, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. When Robert the Bruce was hiding in a cave in Rathlin Island in 1306 or in 1307, somewhere around that time. If at first, you don't succeed. Try, try again. And you know in life, don't you? To succeed, you need to keep trying. But you know, the catechism reminds us in relation to Christ, our priest, it was very, very Very different. He didn't have to keep trying and trying and trying to win our salvation. Now what does the catechism say? Christ executeth the office of a priest in his once, just once, offering up of himself a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and reconcile us to God and in making continual intercession for us. With that wee spider in that cave in Rathlin Island to reach the other side and thereby to begin to weave its web. It had to try and try and try again. But our Savior didn't have to. Try and try again. Because he was sinless. Because he was perfect. And when he offered up himself a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice on Calvary's tree. That sacrifice was accepted and that sacrifice was sufficient. And that reminds us surely 
of one of the central truths of the gospel and how a man and how a woman is saved. Not through good works. Not through trying and trying and trying in the hope that if they continue to try eventually they will succeed. The only way to be saved is to trust in Christ's once and all-sufficient offering on Calvary's tree. And the hymn 360 today reminds us of how wonderful that truth is. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus What a wonderful friend is he, for he left all the glory of heaven, came to earth to die on Calvary. Well, we bring to our Father in heaven our prayers of intercession. Let us all pray. Eternal Father, already this day we have read your word. And we have read how dark things were during the reign of Manasseh, the king of Jerusalem and the king of Judah. But our Father... The world in which we live today is clearly and plainly just as dark as the world in which Manasseh found himself. That being the case, our Father, we come to you and we pray for your servants. We pray for those people who are seeking throughout this world to proclaim the truth of your word, who are seeking to proclaim the whole counsel of God, who are seeking to proclaim the gospel of God. Even the events surrounding the World Cup in Qatar and all the hypocrisy and all the darkness that we listen to and that we see, reminds us how far this nation has fallen. 
At one time our God, known as a nation built upon and centered upon your word. But today our Father, the great and the good, the sportsmen and the sportswoman, the people whose voices are continually hectoring us. They have no thought or they have no fear or they have no shame about what they think and what they believe. So we come and we pray for this nation of which we are a part. We pray for your word as it is preached in many, many pulpits and in many, many halls throughout this Lord's day. May those who need to hear come to hear. And may those who own your name not be ashamed no matter what the pressure to walk that straight and narrow road that leads to heaven and to home. We pray to you as a congregation for our own people, especially those unable to be with us today. May they know your blessing. May they know your protection. And may they know your help. And as we come now to look at your word, we pray once again you would speak with that voice that wakes the dead, that voice that we need and must hear. For it's in the Saviour's name we pray. Amen. The darkness, the darkness deepens. While living in West Belfast many, many years ago now, on Tennant Street, I was out one Saturday washing the car, as many people used to do on the Saturday. A new family had just moved in across the street. And thankfully, for reasons that will soon become clear, they didn't stay that long in that house. Anyway, that Saturday as I washed the car, a number of young boys came out of the house opposite. They just moved into. They came across the street in my direction. I'd washed the side of the car, the front of the car, the front window, the headlights, and was just coming round to wash the back of the car. I looked back and just outside where Crumlin Road Methodist Church used to stand, there were some bricks and some half bricks. And one of the little boys, the oldest it would seem of the group, he simply lifted half a brick, pulled his arm back and threw it in the direction of my car and smashed the back window. There were violent days in that part of the city. And so it was those young boys didn't even rush across the street into the house. But they stood and they waited. They stood and almost taunted me as to what I would do, as to what I was going to do to them because they just put half a brick through the back car window. But they were violent days in the city. And as a result, those who were in authority had no interest whatsoever in petty vandalism. But some days later, I bumped into a, a member of the RUC, a detective who was sometimes seen out and about in our area. And I simply asked him when I bumped into him on the road, are you going to do anything about the vandalism? Are you going to do anything about the car? And the wee boy who smashed the window off the car, I can bring you to the house, I can 
name him, I can identify him. But the detective simply said, to be honest, will not do anything. There's no point. That same young man has moved from one house to another house and has caused havoc and destruction no matter where the housing executive have placed him. And I'll tell you the truth, David, unless we get somewhere in the region of 29 to 30 complaints or charges totaled up against that young boy, the judicial process, is quite simply not interesting. Well, as we look once again at Manasseh and his downfall, his apostasy from the truth, the evidence is piling up high against him. If there was such a thing as an RUC charge sheet In the day of Manasseh, that charge sheet would have almost been full. Already you will remember he has broken the fifth commandment, dishonoring his father. He has reintroduced the worship of the Asherah. He has reintroduced the worship of the Baal. He has introduced the worship of the sun and the moon and the stars and has brought such heathen objects and and altars and images and statutes into the very house of the Lord. And then to cap it all, we discovered during our last study, he has sacrificed his own sons in the fire to please the God called Molech. So already, without doubt, there is sufficient proof to prove the assertion of verse 2. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. There is sufficient proof. But the list of charges is not quite complete. For as we look at verse 6, we discover other things that this king was involved in. What do we read there in verse 6? And he burned his sons as an offering in the valley of the son of Hinnom and used fortune-telling and omens and sorcery and dealt with mediums and with wizards. turns to fortune telling the scripture tells us and the fact that Manasseh was one who turned to the fortune teller indicates that Manasseh was one who wanted to look into who wanted to see the future he wanted to see did Manasseh what he didn't need to see he wanted to see did Manasseh what God alone was able to see. He was not content to leave the present and the future in the hands of God. And so it is he turns to the fortune teller and in engaging the services of the fortune teller, he is flagrantly disobeying the living God who in Leviticus 19 and verse 26 said, In black and white language, you shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. Manasseh turns to the fortune teller. But also we read in the same verse, and equally condemned, Manasseh turns to the interpretation of omens to direct his life. An omen has been defined as a sign with prophetic significance that portends an exceptionally notable or disastrous event. 
natural phenomena, strange birth defects, or animals acting in inexplicable ways are all commonly seen as omens. That's how it was in Manasseh's day. The people would see strange things happening in nature and would go to those who believed they were able to interpret these omens to try to find out what they meant for the future. And as it was in Manasseh's day, so it is the case, is it not, in our day, especially in what would be termed superstitious circles. Some people are frightened, aren't they? If a black cat crosses their path because they view such a thing as a bad omen. Other people are scared and other people are frightened if they see a certain number of magpies. And on occasions they will go to an individual who says that they can read these things, they can read these omens, and they believe in turning to these individuals, they will find out what they mean. Manasseh in his day was involved in such darkness and brought upon himself and the nation the judgment of God. But then thirdly, we discover in verse 6 that this king Manasseh is also involved in what is interpreted, what is translated here, sorcery. In other words, when his fortune was told, or someone on his behalf read or interpreted an omen. Manasseh would hear that interpretation. Manasseh would read that interpretation. And if he didn't like it, what would he do? He would turn to a sorcerer. He would turn to one who practiced the dark arts, who practiced magic. In an attempt to do what? In an attempt to change the future. Such people use the forces of darkness they believe to affect the future. And when Manasseh was told something he didn't want to hear, he went to these sorcerers in the hope the forlorn and foolish hope that they could change the future. We have already discovered, haven't we, how Manasseh's father was a good and was a godly man, was a good and was a godly king, who saw to it that the temple was reopened, who saw to it that the truth of God once again was preached in the nation. And so it was from he was a boy. Manasseh would have been taught. Manasseh would have been reminded in the words of our catechism that the living God has ordained whatsoever comes to pass. And because the living God has ordained whatsoever comes to pass. No sorcerer. Can ever change that. But such is the apostasy and the unbelief of this king that when he's given bad news in relation to the future, he makes his way to the sorcerer that he or she might practice magic to change what God has. Ordeal. But not only does he turn to the sorcerer, not only does he turn to those who read the omen, not only does he turn to the fortune tellers, but verse 6 also tells us he 
consulted with mediums. And again, what is a medium? One definition explains it so. A medium is a person claiming to be in contact with the spirits of the dead and communi to communicate between the dead and the living. Isn't that hard to understand? Isn't that hard to take in that this king, the king of Jerusalem and the king of Judah, he turns to those who claim that they are able to speak to the dead, who he was wanting to communicate with, we don't know. But if we speculate, I would say he had no desire whatsoever to communicate with his father, Hezekiah. For he has no time for his father. Could it be that he was wanting to go back to the generation beyond? Could it be that he was wanting to talk to his grandfather, to Ahaz, who was a godless and a heathen king? We don't know. But he plays around, doesn't he? With the darkness. As he approaches the medium. Not only does he use mediums to contact the dead. But verse 6 tells us he also turns to the wizard. As king of Judah, his first port of call for counsel and guidance and help should have been the true priests of the living God. Furthermore, as king of Judah, when he needed help, what should he have done? What could he have done? He could have in personal prayer prayed to the God of heaven. He could have done that. He should have done that. But such is his unbelief. Such is his utter apostasy. When he needs counsel, when he needs guidance, when he needs intervention, he turns to the wizard. He turns to a witchcraft to help him and to direct him. We see this now, don't we? We read this now, don't we? And if there were such a thing in Manasseh's day as an R-U-C charge seat, he would surely be brought before the authority and found guilty on innumerable counts. But in conclusion then, what is the result? Or what was the result of all of this darkness? Well, first of all, Manasseh does something very foolish, doesn't he? Through engaging in the dark arts. What does he do? He provokes the anger of God. Again, we read in verse 6, in the end of that verse, he did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. You know, a little bit earlier in our study of the Catechism number 25, I referred to that saying that is sometimes an often attributed to Robert the Briss. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. But you know, only this last week, I was reading about the Spanish conquistadors as they made their way through South, Central, and much of North America, as well as the 
Caribbean islands. And I had reason to think on another old saying. Let sleeping dogs lie. Let sleeping dogs lie. And maybe you ask, why did you think on that saying when you read about the Spanish conquistadors, when you read about Columbus and his exploration? Well, the story is told of how Columbus and 200 Spanish soldiers faced a force of 10,000 Arawak Indians. 200 Spanish soldiers versus 10,000 Arawak Indians. But not only did the Spanish have at their disposal 200 men, only 200 men, but the 20 horsemen as well. But you know the secret of their success? was the fact that along with the 200 soldiers, the 20 horsemen, and all the weapons at their disposal, the Spanish also called to war. And to that particular battle, 20 war dogs. So far as the Spanish were concerned, one war dog could take out 50 of the native population, 50 of the native soldiers when they went into battle. And so it was, we are told, battle commenced. And the 200 Spanish soldiers, along with the 20 horsemen and the 20 war dogs, routed 10,000 of the Arawak native people. History tells us how the Spanish trained and how the Spanish treated and how the Spanish used these dogs. They were brutal in how they trained them and history tells us that they literally fed them on the flesh of the native peoples. So when they unleashed them in battle, the dogs wreaked havoc and spread fear. I thought on that, on those dogs, and wondered, was that where that expression originally came from. Let sleeping dogs lie. In other words, if you were in your right mind, especially if you were a native person, if you were wise at all, and you saw those war dogs lying down at rest, what would you do? You wouldn't waken them. You wouldn't stir them. But so far as you could do, you would make sure that they remained asleep. For if they awoke, your fate might be the same as the Arawak native people and so many other people in what was called the new world. You would be mad to awaken those dogs. But that is exactly what Manasseh does as he ceases to believe in God. And as he begins to worship anything and everything, he provokes the Lord to anger. Men and women in our day and in our generation, surely that is something we ought to be careful, so careful that we do not do. In our day, 
and in our generation. We need to be reminded. And the world in which we live needs to be reminded. And all those politicians and all those sportsmen and all those sportswomen who laugh in the face of God, they need to be reminded that not only is the God of heaven a God of grace and a God of mercy, but the God of heaven is a righteous, is a holy, and a pure God who can be provoked by the sinfulness of both rulers and ruled alike. In our day, let us remember such truth and let us learn like never before, the fear, the face of God more than we fear the face of man. Let us pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we read this scripture again today. And it troubles us. We read this scripture again today. And we understand even as the darkness deepened. In Judah and in Jerusalem. So the darkness deepens. In our land. And often sadly even in the visible church of Christ. Today. Help us to see this and help us to understand this. And help us, our God, in our own individual lives and in our own individual witness. Help us not to go down any dark path, but rather help us to walk that straight and that narrow road that alone leads to heaven and leads to home. For it's in our Saviour's name we pray. Amen. We close our service then as we sing a hymn that surely guides us in this day and in this generation. The hymn 555. Courage, friend, and do not stumble. Though your path be dark, as night. There's a star to guide the humble. Trust in God and do the right. That is what the living God calls upon us to do in our day. Though our path may be dark at times as night, we must trust in God and we must do the right.
And now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.